So this event, as I've said, has been brought, being brought to you by the UAL Social Design Institute. And the Social Design Institute is one of UAL's three new institutes, which fosters dialogue and collaboration across the university's colleges. We do that through research, through these centres, which engage with both practitioners and researchers in design, social research, and importantly, public policy. The SDI champions research and practice in social design and design for sustainability, using research insights to inform and change how designers and organisations design and think. And our ultimate mission is to keep in research, <laughs> keep research at the forefront and to make a positive social and environmental dis um, difference. So just thinking about what we're going to talk about today, um, thinking about UAL as an arts institute, artists have long worked on contemporary issues using new and novel ways to help us all engage with our environment on a deeper level than verbal discourse can create alone and there is growing acceptance certainly of design methods and policy development and for this we can look to academic works of Manzini, Chris Basin, our own SDI director Professor Lucy Kimball and one of my supervisors um, and the practice of policy labs, including the Cabinet Office within the UK Civil Service, where one of our speakers today works, um, shows that we can use and think about, certainly design, in different ways to inform how we think about and how we deliver policy. But the potential for art and art practices in policy formation and implementation, however, has been less explored. And part of our event here today with our two fantastic speakers looks to shed some light on that particular area. Our first speaker, Stephen Bennett, um, is a CLAW Leadership Fellow and he's also co-head of the Policy Lab, which is part of the Cabinet Office. Stephen is a policymaker, but is also an artist whose work explores the interaction between art, science and politics. He received his MFA from our very own Central St Martins, where he studied art and science and his practice combines. Well, I'll let him speak to that um, in your presentation that's coming up. So without further ado, Stephen. Hi. Um, thanks for the intro, uh, Daniela, and uh, lovely to reconnect as well, and nice to meet everyone. So yeah, my presentation, hang on, um, sorry, I need to share my um, stuff, don't I? Okay, is that now, can someone give me a verbal on whether they're seeing the slide? Yeah, okay, thanks, Aaron. Um, so um, yeah, my presentation is on the role for art in policy. Um, and uh, I'm going to start this uh, as I kind of start a lot of projects. Um, by thinking about definitions and what is policy. Uh, so this is um, sort of a kind of complicated idea uh, that I guess will be of interest to most people on the call, which is why you're here. But it's still worth um, just sort of being fairly precise on here. So I have a definition, uh, which is the sum total, this is what policy is, the sum total of government action from signals of intent to the final outcomes and including decisions not to take action. And there's just a couple of um, useful things to draw out from this definition of policy. Uh, so on the next slide, we just um, see the word government highlighted here. Now, this is the context in which I'm looking at it. And as uh, Daniel said, I am um, head of the policy lab, uh, which is part of the civil service, um, which is, you know, so obviously I'm very interested in government. That's not to say that policy always needs to be something that government takes or does. Um, individuals may have their own policies and actually UAL uh, will have its interest, its own policies as well. I was speaking with Heather Barnett, who's the um, course leader uh, at, at Art and Science, and she was talking about the work that I think UAL, it might have been CSM, has done on um, the climate emergency. So that's an, an example of an institution having its own policy. But I'm talking about government policy here and I'm also something else that's worth dwelling on is that uh, government action could be at different levels so I'm probably thinking of it mainly at the national level um, but later Hannah will be talking about that at the international level uh, and you also might think about government policy at the local or civic or municipal level. Okay let's crack on uh, because sometimes uh, images mean more than words and so here's a collage uh, of some policies uh, that I've put together and I guess what it tries to illustrate is that uh, to me policies matter. So we could play quite a fun game here where everyone could try and guess what, what each of the images, uh, which policy that denotes. Uh, we probably don't have time for that but just to pick out a couple of these um, so uh, this one uh, you may recognize uh, what, at least one of the people in this photo 
Um, so this is a photo of Margaret Thatcher handing over the deeds of a uh, previously a council house to the Pattersons of Harold Hill uh, in Essex in 1980. And this was um, a result of a policy called the UK Housing Act, which gave council tenants the right to buy the houses they lived there, described by some commentators as the, uh, a piece of legislation which enabled the transfer of so much capital wealth to the state. Uh, from the state to the people. So you might think that's a great thing, you might think that's a terrible thing, uh, but it seems like that's an important policy. Uh, another example from my collage is um, in 2019, legislation was laid in the House of Parliament to ban um, the supply of plastic straws, stirrers and cotton buds, and I think also to put up the charge on plastic bags. Um, actually, some people have said that that's a result of um, uh, the BBC's Blue Planet 2, the David Attenborough documentary, um, and actually some of the people involved in the policy making process have attributed that as influential, which kind of picks up uh, some of these threads about how um, culture and art can be influential for policy making. Um, I'm going to come to that in more detail in a second. Um, so um, just to skip on to a, uh, before getting into the role that art might play, I think it's just worth dwelling on how policy gets made. So this is something I spend a lot of my sort of well, part of my week involved at when I'm working at the policy lab. Uh, and I, I should also say I've been a civil servant for about 15 years, so I have a lot of experience of the policy making system. This image has been put together by, um, uh, I think the concept for it was from Lucy Kimball, who's the head of the Social Design Institute, um, and Holly McDonald did the illustration. And it shows um, the day, day life of a policymaker. This is what the sort of world looks like. And it, I think it's a great diagram or a great illustration because it really shows the sort of complexity, the mess and the sort of difficulty which policymakers are dealing with. You see all these different pressures that are influencing the mind of a policymaker or trying to influence that mind. You've got parliament, you've got pressure groups, you've got other governments, you've got media, constituents, experts, et cetera, et cetera. And I love the image on the screen uh, for the policymaker. The one thing that they're told to do is just hurry up. Um, and I, I think a lot of policymakers, a lot of civil servants, people in government would sympathise with this approach. You know, there is a lot of pressures on people. Uh, and this fits um, with a concept developed by Paul Kearney, uh, who's a very interesting um, writer. Uh, he, he did the definition that I referred to earlier. So you might want to just have a quick read over this. So an extract from a, uh, an article in Nature magazine. Uh, and it says, uh, basically, I guess the key points are, here are that uh, policymakers can't, can't take in everything, all of that information. And the mi middle bit, I think, is helpful here. People, you, people and policymakers are people, uh, believe it or not. People use shortcuts to gather enough information to make decisions quickly. The rational, by cl uh, pursuing clear goals and priorities in certain times of evidence and information. And the irrational, by drawing on emotions, gut feelings, values, beliefs, habits, and the familiar to make decisions quickly. Um, they, they kind of talk, uh, they use the word irrational a bit provocatively uh, and not necessarily dis dismissively. I think it's worth clarifying that. Um, but this gets, it brings us to this concept, sort of technical concept of bounded rationality. And this is the idea, it's in contrast to comprehensive rationality. An individual does not have knowledge of ev all of the information. <laughs> That's impossible. Uh, we only can have, in, uh, access to a subset of the information and that brings in this opportunity for influence for values for emotions uh, for quick thinking and I think that's a really important concept which I'll come back to but now what I want to do is just talk about how I've approached this in my practice uh, and actually this is a historical example first of all from uh, when I was at Central St Martins doing the art and science course um, and it's on climate data so um, you know if you kind of go digging around on the internet you can find all kinds of information. Uh, as one of the interviews for my uh, project, um, Imran Khan, uh, ex-head of the uh, public engagement at the Wellcome Trust said, the, the facts on climate change aren't really in dispute. Like, maybe there are in a couple of countries in the world that we might think of, but, but in Europe, it's sort of fairly given, you know, the facts on climate change. And, and here we have uh, a, 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 an image showing the change of precipitation uh, in the Middle East in 2000, uh, 2080. Um, the, the dark red uh, denotes uh, a ma massive reduction in precipitation. You know, this is kind of the, the facts that we're aware of. Um, but, but I guess what we're not necessarily seeing is the appropriate action being taken on a global level and by certain national governments. So the way that I've approached this as, a, as an artist, uh, and I should say that, you know, this is me speaking as, a, as an artist, not necessarily as a policymaker, is I've sort of zoomed in on this information, tried to kind of sort of bring out and, and um, bring out some of that, um, taken some of this data, 
um, broken that down uh, and tried to turn some of this sort of abstract data, which you can find sort of deep on the internet, into something that can be physically felt, seen, seen, uh, touched, um, experienced. Uh, and I did that um, by creating a, um, a stained glass piece, a stained glass data uh, uh, inf informational or, or visual, um, and then hung that, which was part of my interim uh, show for my MA, uh, hung that in a gallery, um, shined some light through it, uh, and drew a map uh, of the area on the ground. Uh, and this was for me to try and provide a visceral and embodied and significant experience of this abstract policy data. Uh, and yeah, you could have quite a lot of fun with how you sort of played around the lighting, the, the sort of space that you put that in. Uh, really, the aim was to um, create a space that people could engage with the information in a way that perhaps a policy document doesn't necessarily achieve. Um, a, a more sort of visual, a more um, uh, material way of engaging with policy information. Creating that space for dialogue and discussion about meaning and policy. And also um, as a great filter of selfies, of course. So the second example I wanted to give um, was uh, uh, on ageing policy. Now, the previous example was from, from my personal practice. The second example is, is from my work in Policy Lab. Um, and, oh, sorry, just, um, Daniel, I can't remember if you said this at the beginning, but I think all the questions, like, we're really keen on questions, but I think Danielle is going to um, sort of farm all the questions and, and facilitate that as uh, towards the ends of the presentations. And so I'm not ignoring them. I'm looking forward to all your, all your questions and raised hands. Um, so, ageing policy. Um, when I was working at the Government Office of Science, uh, we wrote an amazing report, uh, a beautiful report, uh, a really kind of rich, detailed and long report on the future of an aging population. Uh, and this is one of the shelves um, uh, that you might typically find in a government organisation uh, where all of these great reports are, are stored uh, and not necessarily read. I think this is something that a lot of people from academia will be familiar with as well. Um, it's difficult, going back to the bounded rationality, it's difficult for policymakers and people and the public to engage with such a weighty evidence base and to consider, which is the thing that we really wanted to consider uh, in this piece of policy making. What do we want from a future aging population? What does good look like? What does success look like? So um, this is how we approached it. Um, so here's an image. Uh, and this image was produced by um, a really interesting design consultancy called Strange Telemetry. Um, and uh, I'll show you some more images in a sec. But they produced these um, speculative um, street scenes, kind of worlds to help people think about the future of aging. They, they were from a future world where our, our aging population might exist. Uh, here's another one of their amazing images. So, so I was a kind of commissioner of this piece, but um, influential in shaping the brief. I wasn't, I wasn't actually. The artist here. Uh, actually, I mean, they provoked real reactions. Um, people kind of really responded to them quite viscerally um, in, and in quite unexpected ways, actually. Um, uh, so, um, you know, people kind of saying, you know, uh, commenting on like very intricate parts of these um, visuals. Um, commenting on the, the kind of look and feel of them, saying, you know, where are all the people? This kind of future world of ageing, you know, where all robots are helping us. You know, where are the, where are the human interactions? Where are the people? So people liked the futuristic scenes, some less so. But it opened, what it did is open a conversation about what we want from the future. If people didn't like it, really reacted to some of these images. That was absolutely great because we kind of that opened a space for discussion um, about like what what we might think is good. Um, and um, uh, I mean, it's always hard to evidence how these things kind of play out, but it seems that these created the conditions for the governance um, industrial strategy back in 2017 to focus on the ageing society. So that had a real influence. OK, I'm just drawing to the end of my uh, presentation here uh, and we want to leave time for um, uh, questions. Um, so just to sort of, sort of summarise um, where, where my thinking is at. So. Um, hopefully you can see this from some of the um, examples I've shown, uh, including the Blue Planet piece and, and some examples that you'll be able to think of, you know, of, of our artists who are working in the space. But art does a certain number of things, and this is by no means an exclusive list, but it can have a cognitive impact. It can raise information. Thanks, Phil, Ed Popper. That would be really interesting to put through the, this process. Um, but, but art can... Um, you know, raise awareness of issues that you might not have, have known about. I think the Blue Planet example is a good one there. Of course, I think it almost goes without saying, uh, but art has an, often has an emotional impact. 
Art can create visions of alternatives to the status quo. You might think of some sci-fi might be a really interesting experience, example of that. Art often provides policy relevant information uh, or can provide policy relevant information in a multi-sensory way. Uh, visual, um, audio, kinesthetic, physical, embodied uh, way of experiencing and engaging with a, a policy issue which is different from a, from a long written document uh, which not everyone engages with. Um, art can often create, uh, create a, a space for dialogue. Um, uh, I was really, uh, I, I sort of picked up on this from my discussions with Heather Barnett, whose work um, on um, slime mould is actually really almost the whole point of the work is to create a discussion between people. The people are the artwork. Uh, and of course, you'll, you'll, you'll see that in many other artists' practice. And finally, a sense of agency. Uh, I think um, Theatre of the Oppressed is a really interesting and very obvious example uh, of where a piece of art actually provides agency to act. Um, so, you know, in summary, art, art kind of produces the intellectual and emotional effects through which it, it, it can elucidate values, ideas, feelings. And then if we just kind of con um, combine that with how policy gets made, we've, we've already sort of looked at how policy making is informed by your evidence, yes, um, but also values, also emotions, and especially given uh, our, all of our bounded rationality, policymakers are just like humans, uh, just like humans, uh, we, we have this sort of bounded rationality. Um, uh, and art produces intellectual and emotional effects which can uh, elucidate values, ideas, and themes. Therefore, QED, I just spoke over my computer screen, I'm really glad we're not in a uh, lecture theatre here. Um, therefore, art can inform policy. Um, so, so this is the slide that kind of brings it all together. Um, as part of my research, um, I am going to be uh, showing an exhibition uh, and integrating the experience of the artwork into this research, which is something my supervisor, uh, Patricia uh, Kosniski, is, is really sort of, um, has really brought out in her writing. Um, so actually um, trying to um, illustrate or, or um, make real some of these ideas, some of these findings in a, in a real exhibition. Um, that's obviously COVID pending, but hopefully happening um, at the beginning of June, so look out for that. And um, I'll be publishing a lot of uh, information um, shortly. I've already written three blogs on this. Um, so if you follow uh, my website or me on Twitter or Instagram, um, that's a way of getting um, uh, some of these findings and um, finding out more information about forthcoming stuff, including the exhibition and further blogs. And I think that is me, bang on 15 minutes. I didn't think I'd be able to get through 44 slides in that time. I'm gonna hand over to Daniela, I think. Perfectly timed, um, Stephen. Um, thank you so much for that. And for anyone who joined during the presentation, just to remind again that we'll have an opportunity for questions at the end of both presentations. Um, and so I will lead into our second speaker today, who is Hannah. Um, Hannah is a doctoral candidate here at UAL, um, Chelsea College of Arts, and she is also co-founder and curator of the art project Displacement Uncertain Journeys. But importantly, she's also a lawyer by training, um, with over 15 years of experience working with the United Nations, um, states, NGOs on issues related to humanitarian affairs and the protection of displaced people. Hannah is currently bridging these two worlds by exploring how contemporary art practice and research can contribute to the development of international law and policy to protect the rights of people displaced by disasters and climate change. And this is the subject of her presentation today. Um, Anna, uh, is hand over. Hello, can you hear me? Excellent, thank you so much, Daniela. Just going to start my presentation. Okay, can you see it? Yes, yes. Yes, perfect, thanks, Stephen. Okay, great. So, so first of all, I just wanted to say how uh, grateful I am for this opportunity to share my research through the Social Design Institute. I really appreciate it. And I also wanted to express my appreciation to the UAL or to, for UAL for the studentship that also supports my research. Um, so today, the title of my um, presentation is Art and International Norm Development, Opportunities for Policy-Oriented Artistic Practice. So I just want to give a caveat at the beginning to say that this is ongoing research, so please excuse omissions, errors, um, etc. 
So this project, as, as uh, Daniela mentioned, is grounded in my initial training as a lawyer and my work addressing protection and assistance needs of people displaced by disasters. So over the years, we've learned that some 23 million people are newly displaced each year by disasters, and that far exceeds those who are displaced by conflict. And we also know that in the absence of action, climate change is only going to make those numbers worse. So although there are a number of states and international organizations and non-governmental organizations working hard to address this issue, it is really complex and, and it's, a, it's a very complex policy issue. So when I started drawing on my research in contemporary art, I, I began this project because I felt like art in all the ways that Stephen uh, really eloquently laid out could really help address some of the factual and emotional elements of displacement that were hard for me to convey in my written reports. At the same time, I was really aware that art was virtually absent from any of the international policy debates that I was participating in. So while I'm ultimately interested in disaster displacement, my research is concerned with the wider question about how states come to agree upon international law and policy. And in that process, what role artists and art can play. So international law is a little bit different from domestic legal systems in that binding international law can be derived from treaties and conventions like the Refugee Convention, but it also comes from what states do in practice, and that's known as customary law. So international uh, relations scholars Martha Finmore and Catherine Sinkic have created this norm life cycle theory, which I illustrated here, which makes it look much less chaotic than Lucy's image. Um, but you have to imagine all of Lucy's little, um, the little uh, people and all the different actors all bouncing up around the, the line that I drew, drew here. Um, but basically, they created a, this theory to try to understand the process to which states adopt certain norms or agreed standards for their behavior, and such as how to protect people displaced by climate change. So the, this theory, like I said, it, it also could be chaotic like Lucy's, but it's, it's this idea that you have interactions between institutions, networks, individuals, and that they, they are interacting over time and that over time about a certain thing that needs to be done, their opinions evolve, coalesce to the point that they're ultimately internalized as international norms by states. So within this process, artists aren't widely recognized as active participants in international norm development. Although, as, as Stephen also mentioned, it, it, the same thing in international relations theory, there's growing recognition of the value of aesthetics and emotions in international relations theory. So just to say, it's for this reason that my research seeks to better understand what role artists and art might play in international norm development. In particular, I'm focusing on diplomatic conversations that take place within intergovernmental institutions and processes. So I'm currently developing a case study on how art has, has historically been understood within the frame of international diplomacy, looking at the United Nations office in Geneva, Switzerland, which is where I'm based. So the United Nations itself, I'm finding out in doing my research, is actually an example of norm development itself. So although we take it it's existed for granted, 75 years ago, it wasn't really a given that the global international organization, the United Nations, as we know it now, would actually succeed. Because just a few years before that, the League of Nations collapsed, largely because the United States did not participate. So when, sorry, so when the United Nations was founded, many member states gave artworks to the organization. So here you can see an example of a diplomatic ceremony where the second UN Secretary General is receiving a gift from the government of Brazil for the United Nations building in New York. And I think these diplomatic gifts of artwork did two things that contributed to norm development and institution building. They decorated the building and that contributed to the physical and aesthetic manifestation of the UN as a legitimate forum for international policy making, so a forum that allows international norm development to happen. And the donated artworks also symbolized a country's commitment to support the existence of the United Nations, as well as a state's desire to exert influence inside that institution. So here's the UN today. Sorry, the slides are popping around. Here's the UN today. And I just have to admit that the Palais holds a special place in my heart since it's where I first interned with UN in 2003. So my office was just above these flags. Um, this, the, but in Geneva, it's a special building. Uh, diplomatic meetings here and informal conversations take place in big conference rooms, lounges, grand hallways. And you have imposing views of Lake Geneva and the Alps. 
So this is the building where the, the gifts of the artwork are shown here in Geneva. Um, upon re receiving so many gifts, the UN ultimately developed terms of reference to guide how, how they would receive artworks from their member states. So I'm not going to read this all, but just note, for instance, that in terms of diplomatic fairness, in theory, a member state should only give one gift. The UN also prefers receiving original artworks of high artistic value or of relevance to the work of the UN. So this is a special sort of art collection that arrives through gifts to the United Nations. They're not actively sought by, by the UN. So the connection, the, the Geneva art collection includes an eclectic mix of paintings, sculptures, historical artifacts, and reproductions. So you'll just see here um, how they're, they're displayed within the Palais de Nation, and they serve as a background for international policymaking. And this collection has been seen and described as visualizing the UN's objectives and aspirations to find peaceful solutions to global conflict through intergovernmental institutions that we now know as the UN. You can see here the display is, is also just in the office buildings. It's where diplomats are walking in, um, as they're going about their daily business. So in 2013, um, or sorry, in 2001, the UN General Assembly passed the Global Agenda for Dialogue Among Civilizations. So this is how the art, the role of art starts to change over time within the UN as the UN starts to evolve. So the UN office at Geneva used this global agenda to guide its cultural policy, explaining on its website how art is not only a form of expression, but also how creativity contributes to how creativity, sorry, creativity um, acts as a catalyst and inspires openness and goodwill and collaboration. So it's this backdrop for diplomacy that it inspires, it inspires uh, diplomatic solutions. So for instance, you can see here in 2008, the UN office in Geneva unveiled a newly renovated Human Rights and Alliance of Civilizations room. And this was a gift from the government of the then UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon called on delegates using this room to be inspired by the Spanish artist Miguel Barcelo Ceiling and declared, let us not settle for the status quo, but instead be visionary, creative, and bold. In addition to the permanent exhibition that the UN has of its artworks, um, it also hosts numerous temporary art exhibitions and cultural events. So most of these events are planned and financed by member states and UN organizations, but often working in collaboration with a non-governmental organization. And this is something to note uh, later on in the conversation when we think about how you might want to bring art into um, an intergovernmental organization, but this, these, these relationships and these collaborations. So the UN has also developed guidelines for exhibitions, which note among other things, that exhibitions must be relevant to the goals and aspirations of the UN and not offend in any individual member state. So we're, again, we're talking about a specific context within which artwork is displayed. Um, I, I wanted to highlight before I conclude that just how art is currently understood within the UN um, and up until uh, recent years, um, I wanted to just highlight this really fascinating study that was um, Lucy uh, Kimball actually pointed out to me. It's great um, by David Doser and Melissa Nisbert from King's College London, where they talked to diplomats at the UN in Geneva to understand how they understood the art and culture at the Palais de Nation. And really the, the diplomats there viewed it in terms of art as a form of soft power and cultural diplomacy to achieve their foreign policy objectives. And so basically the diplomats, many diplomats, not all of them, viewed cultural events as an opportunity to promote their country's broad values or unique culture. Um, so more general values, although there were some, some art that looked at specific policy issues like refugees. But in general, it's looking broadly um, how they understood the role of art in terms of foreign policy. In reflecting on the overall impact of these sorts of works um, or exhibitions or events, many diplomats were convinced that the cultural events were effective diplomatic tools. They thought they were important, a good use of public funds, but they really didn't have evidence to explain why they thought it was why they thought it was effective. And I think some of the research that uh, Stephen was highlighting, I think, could maybe help and explore uh, help with the in terms of international relations literature, why art might be effective and why it might be useful. 
So I'm going to shift here now quickly to talk to you more about, um, so this is what's happening now in the UN, that's my case study, and now I'm going to talk to you about a collaborative project that I curate called Displacement Uncertain Journeys. And at its core, this project is an experiment in how to move art from the background of international policy making to bringing art to bear on the specific policy issue of displacement related to disasters and climate change. So we created this project in 2015 when I was working with the Nansen Initiative, which is a group of states that are concerned about disaster displacement issues. And we worked in partnership with the late Professor Chris Wainwright and his team from UAL and developed that project together. Um, now the project partners with the platform on disaster displacement, which continues the work of the Nansen Initiative. It's complicated. I can explain it later if you want. Um, and with the ongoing support from the Norwegian Council and UAL. So what do our interventions look like? So we curated this panel exhibition, which was commissioned by the UN Office for Disaster Risk Reduction in 2019. This exhibition was on the Lake Geneva border and featured nine artists whose work addressed issues related to displacement and disaster risk. This was, uh, wasn't a standard exhibition for us since it was more focused to the general public. Ideally, we want to bring art into the heart of international conference spaces, intergovernmental conference spaces. So for those of you who haven't yet had an occasion to attend an international or intergovernmental conference, they're generally very formal protocol heavy events and you can spend hours sitting in rooms without any sunlight, listening to officials read formal prepared statements one after another. So it's a really, it's really it can be exhausting. Um, so we really love to bring artworks that directly engage delegates and help prompt conversations. So here we are at the Civil Society Days um, at the Global Forum on Migration and Development in Marrakesh, Morocco, where we partnered with the Platform on Disaster Displacement and the Danish artist Soren Dahlgaard, who invited delegates to carry his inflatable island as a symbol of all people who may be forced to leave home, their homes because of climate change. Here's an installation of Lucy and Jorge Orta's Antarctic Village No Borders and Antarctica World Passport Bureau. It was located in the conference center hosting the intergovernmental. So the, the last meeting was the civil society. This was the intergovernmental uh, part of the global forum, which addressed a wide, wide set of policy issues addressing international migration. So this was a, a conference that lasted over several days. Uh, so given the diversity of the issues at stake, the platform on disaster displacement wanted to make sure that delegates at that conference were thinking about people who would be displaced by disasters. So over the course of the, of the exhibition, well over 1,000 conference delegates lined up to receive a stamped copy of the Orta's Antarctica World Passport. And this was a utopian proposal to address climate change related displacement by facilitating visa free travel to enter any country in the world. And that might not sound controversial a conference about international migration that's based on borders. Uh, that utopian proposal starts to have a mean something it means something very different. A big part of our project is also not only showing the artwork in the context of intergovernmental policy discussions, but also facilitating direct conversations between artists and policymakers. So here Soren is discussing his work with conference delegates. We've also screened short films as part of meetings during conferences. So here's a work by Austrian artistic duo Honey and Bunny, and it's being screened as part of the UN Task Force on Displacement, which took place at the UN Climate Change Conference in Madrid, um, known as COP25. So now you're hearing about COP26 in Glasgow. So this was uh, in Madrid. At COP25, we worked with the we um, we also worked with the platform on disaster displacement and coal. So another partnership that I'm going to highlight, an arts organization in Paris that addresses environmental issues, and we held a number of events at the French government's pavilion in the Blue Zone, which is only accessible to registered diplomats and observers. So during three weeks, we featured the work of the 2019 coal prize winners and invited delegates to reflect on the relevance of the artwork and their work at the climate climate conference. Here, I just want to highlight um, the fact that what we have here are um, the 2019 Coal Prize winners, Lena Dobrovalsky and Theo Ormanskeeping, 
And they had a dedicated brainstorming session that lasted over an hour uh, with delegates to talk about how to develop the storyline for their upcoming film, You Never Know, One Day You Too May Become a Refugee. And although these pictures might not look very exciting for you, to me, this is actually one of our most successful events and that we created an opportunity for meaningful exchange between the artists and the delegates to discuss how artists could contribute to international policymaking related to climate change and displacement. So for me, very exciting. So just some, uh, in terms of talking about the displacement exhibitions, um, ideally what we tried to do is we created uh, or curated art interventions that were tailored to specific conference topics. So some on disaster risk reduction, some on migration, some on climate change. And we tried to give visibility to disaster displacement in that busy conference space. We sought to break the routine and create memorable moments so that delegates who are working on those issues might remember disaster displacement later in their work. We sought to create opportunities for informal exchange and reflection, not only amongst policymakers, but also between the artists. And we sought to explore nuances and subtleties of disaster displacement through works that appeal to emotions and created embodied experiences. Again, think about this. All of that was only possible through extensive co Hello? Again, um, all of that was only possible through extensive collaboration with others um, who helped us con conceptualize policy priorities, negotiate access into the conference, and help finance the interventions. And so, as I mentioned, uh, particularly that was the platform on disaster displacement, the Norwegian Refugee Council, and UAL. And in this case here, it was the government of France who was represented by their, uh, the French ambassador for climate. So we had very senior level support for that, for that event. Um, as, I, as I conclude, I just want to talk about very briefly other opportunities that, are, that I'm learning about, about how art can be more than just a symbol or background for international policymaking. So if you're interested, uh, I'm happy to tell you more about it. So there's this special rapporteur in the field of cultural rights who recently uh, presented a report to the UN Human Rights Council highlighting the role that socially engaged art practices are playing in protecting human rights in various post-conflict countries. UNESCO's Art Lab is promoting artistic research in policy development and project delivery. That's a, a report that just came out last December. And finally, I'm excited about the fact that the TBA 21 Academy got observer status to the UN affiliated International Seabed Authority. And this allows this arts organization to submit its interdisciplinary artistic research on oceans to this, to this, um, to this inter intergovernmental body. Um, so I, as I conclude, um, I just wanted to talk about this idea of this conceptual length, what all of this means in terms of bringing art into policy and international policy making. So I'm thinking about conceptualizing this idea of policy oriented artistic practice um, as a contribution to international norm development. And as I think about what that means, I've been reflecting on my role as a curator, trying to bridge the world of art and international policy making. And what I've been looking for are artists who want to find solutions by working in collaboration with governments, which we can't take for given. I've also had to work to ensure that artists understand the policy environment of each exhibition and we think about how their work will be understood. Um, and also you saw some of the environments where we have to think about how to make it possible for policymakers to engage with the work, um, recognizing that international conferences are busy, delegates don't necessarily see art as part of their core work. So you have to create a space and an opportunity for policymakers to engage with the work. And it also requires extreme flexibility because these intergovernmental meetings are planned at the last minute often. We rarely see the space in advance. And that creates lots of challenges in terms of even just thinking about exhibition design and financing. So those are some elements of thinking about what it means to bring art into this specific policy environment. Um, so I'm going to conclude now, but I would love to continue the discussion to think about how policy oriented artistic practice might be different, depending on which level of government the artist is addressing. Um, and how that might change depending on the issue that you're working on. Um, so if you want to learn more about the project, this is the website and otherwise I look forward to talking now. Thank you. Thank you so much, so much for Stephen as well as your presentation.
I know we've um, put everybody off in terms of asking questions, but now is the moment. We've got around sort of able to ask questions um, either about your own practice or, um, oh, I think I've lost my video, um, but hopefully you can still hear me. Um, or in relation to anything that you've heard from either Stephen or from Hannah today. Um, I wanted to start off, if I may, with a question to sort of both of you. Um, one of the aspects that really sort of fascinates me about your work is that um, both as sort of curator and a sort of art practitioner, you're both involved in very conventional organizations so you know the sort of the center of power in some ways so the cabinet office is the center of the uk government in terms of, sort of decision making and coordinating the un sort of brings together you know sort of supranational organization how does it feel and and do you think that that influences your approach either as sort of practitioner or as curator where you find yourself located in terms of policy Oh, Danielle, I thought you'd give us a good one, an easy one. Sorry, that is a good one, but it's not an easy one. Um, so uh, can I just say for the record, because I know this is being recorded, um, so Policy Lab has actually moved from um, the Cabinet Office to the Department for Education, um, which is what in uh, the civil service is called a MOG change, machinery of government change. Uh, and it's um, basically because uh, the uh, policy profession is located in the Department for Education and we are moved closer to the policy profession. Okay, just clarify, clarify that. I, Danielle, I think my answer to your question must surely be yes. Uh, undoubtedly working in a, um, you know, in, in a civil service bureaucracy must surely influence everything I do, basically, whether I like it or not. Um, and probably in, in um, and probably in ways that are very problematic if I don't acknowledge that. So I think the only kind of um, strategy that I can adopt is to try and acknowledge that and try to be open with that as much as I can. Um, at the same time, realizing that there'll be blind spots, which I, which I don't even have sight of. Um, so, I mean, yeah, it's a real tricky one. Um, I don't know what, I don't know if Hannah uh, has some thoughts on that as well, but it's a good question, good question. Uh, Daniela. Daniela. Sort of wish I not. Yeah, no, I mean, Daniela, for sure. It's one reason why why I was highlighting the different policies that the UN already has related to exhibiting artwork, that there are restrictions that, that you're dealing with when you want to bring art into that particular setting. And, and I think what we've been trying to do is figure out where are the opportunities to, to work within, uh, to work within those spaces. So, um, and, and that's why I think it's exciting to see that you see in the art collection, a lot of it's paintings, sculptures, but what we're starting to see in, in um, some of the temporary exhibitions, and that's what I'm researching now, that's why I didn't, I didn't present it, um, but also with the, the special repertoire on cultural rights, you're starting to see a broader acceptance of what else art can do, and also we can acknowledge that art is research. So I think it's been limited in the past, but I think you're starting to see openings and opportunities where you could bring art in that can work in different ways. Brilliant. Brilliant. And you've got a question, got a question. Uh, Malcolm. Hi, Danielle. Hi, Malcolm. Hi, Malcolm. How are you doing? How are you doing? Uh, just a quick question to both of you. Um, presumably, policy in general has a has a kind of leading edge or an opportunity edge or a, a fringe. How much is an art identified with that sense of of the leading edge of policy? Shall I take that? Hannah, it might be, um, it might be worth muting yourself just whilst um, speaking. Um, so, um, Malcolm, so it is Malcolm, isn't it? Is it Malcolm? Yes. Malcolm, great yeah. question. Really interesting question. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so actually it relates to some kind of strategy work that I'm doing with my policy lab um, hat on. Um, and um, I mean, there's plenty that you can find out about Policy Lab online. I encourage you to check out the blog and I don't want to necessarily speak on behalf of Policy Lab today because I'm sort of here representing myself. Um, but uh, the team is, is about bringing in innovative citizen-centered approaches into government. Um, and it's, it's really interesting. If you look over the last 10 years, I think design and especially user-centered design is a really interesting case study where 
actually user centered design has begun to pretend to penetrate in some departments the mainstream of policy making. Now, I was actually having a live discussion on this last week. I think in some areas it's, it's less um, well received, but in other areas, um, the Ministry of Justice, for example, have a user-centered design lab uh, and other, other departments have that as well. So you might argue that design and especially user-centered design is, is getting more established. And then that kind of leads to another question, which is, well, where's the cutting edge? Where is the forefront? And I think my contribution, as well as being the head of Policy Lab, what, uh, one of the co-heads co of Policy Lab, what I try and do is bring an artistic perspective because I think art and policy making is kind of quiet. It's, I haven't met many, many people in the civil service who are doing what I'm doing or interested in what I'm doing. Um, and I think the combination that myself and Hannah bring is a bit unusual. So I think it is there. I think it is at the cutting edge. Um, I'm really interested in looking at performing arts as well, theatre, dance. Um, Dan Amen, Daniela mentioned I'm on the Claw Leadership Fellowship, uh, and you know we have um, people who work for um, the Ipswich um, Dance Theatre, um, for some really interesting um, theatre producers in York. I'd, I would love to sort of understand what their contributions to policy making could be as well. And then of course outside the arts as well. So you know my, my interest in the arts, but you you can look at technology. Bitcoin dealers, you know, maybe we should have Bitcoin dealers come and speak to us uh, about policy. Uh, do you have any thoughts yourself? What might be at the cutting edge? Oh, I'd, I'd rather not. I want to hear you two speak. I'm, I've, I speak a lot about stuff. Okay. Well, it sounds like you thought about that. Great question. Hi, Malcolm. I, I think I think there's lots of opportunity there, and it's one reason why when I was talking about even when we think about how international law develops. It doesn't just happen, you know, I'm focusing on the intergovernmental institutions, but that's not where it starts. For, for example, something that I work on is people being displaced within their own countries. And that issue got attention originally by non-governmental organizations that were organizing and working on that topic. So I think, and, and that's where I think, you know, I was asking questions about, we think, what's the role of art as norms develop over time? And that's where I think the role of art also might change. So maybe maybe that the cutting edge role of art when a norm is developing is, or, or an issue that hasn't been fully explored, maybe could be brought out and given more attention through art and help advance policy in that way by, by helping clarify what a specific issue is that needs to be addressed. I don't know if that makes sense. Um, it, does. it does. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Brilliant. I Brilliant. see that we've got, uh, Stephen's asked a question about, uh, about Hopper. So um, um, Edward Hoppert, I'm not sure if, I mean, we've got a lot, a lot of academics who know about art who maybe want to speak about that in the context of our subject today. While we tease somebody up to talk about that, I did have another question, which was to our audience, because I know we've got a mix of people. I mean, I myself am very much involved in public policy, and public policy space and discourse. But perhaps for people who are more on the sort of art practitioner side, um, Hannah, for example, you curate, and, and you sort of alluded to this within your presentation, but there's so much that's happening right now. You know, you think of the last 12 months and you think of Black Lives Matter and you think of, you know, women and violence against women and girls and, and people wanting to make a difference, both within their practice and within their, their lived experiences and having an impact how might they penetrate the world of policy in terms of having an impact through their own practice? Daniela, I got, I got distracted by Phil's point in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. why, do, why do we save you why do we save the, the hopper discussion so yeah. perhaps if, so if just I, what was the final part of what was the final part of your question there i suppose the question is, is that if i'm creative and i'm i've got my practice and it's relevant and it's meaningful and it's now and i think how on earth can i take this from my own space or even an artistic space and position that within a policy space Okay, I've, I can have a go at that, but um, Hannah, I don't know if you want to go first. Go ahead, it's okay. Okay, so um, I think towards the end of my presentation, I showed those those sort of six um, sort of ways that art can play a role in policy, uh, and it includes it included sort of having a cognitive impact, having an emotional impact with policy information, uh, creating a space for dialogue. And I guess wh where I'm going with my research is trying to frame it as in if you are producing artwork about policy information that meets any of those six criteria, 
then it probably will have a policy impact or, or is, is positioned uh, to have a policy impact. So I think that's part of it. And I um, haven't sort of published on that yet. And um, I just need to finish this research and put out some blogs. So, so my number one point is sign up to my blogs <laughs> so, so that you can see when I actually publish this. Uh, my number two point is almost if you can produce artwork which meets those those kind of six ways of having a policy impact, um, then it will probably have a policy impact. But I think there's also a third point, which is maybe about tactics. Um, so about how you actually, what are your tactics for actually influencing and engaging? Uh, I think Hannah spoke about this uh, in quite an interesting way, like being present in meetings. Uh, which, which meetings? Like there's different layers of meetings, you know, that before you get to the kind of policy makers. Um, how you might position yourself. The HRC have written um, a document which, which I think is is about like how how people from the arts and the humanities may want to influence policymakers. It's kind of quite dry, but it talks about some of the processes that you might want to go through. So I think there's three sort of areas there. Um, but I think the most the most important things are you know producing your way in a way you know that meets these kind of criteria, and then some of the tactics as well. Yeah, I mean, I think I think in addition in addition to that, I think that's all that's all good advice. Um, I would also really encourage you to think about think about your practice and what are you really what are you really interested in? Like, what are, what are you really passionate about? And then and then take time to actually read and understand the the the, the ongoing policy debates. Find someone who works on that issue and talk to them about it because I think. One of the things I've, I've seen that is a real shame is sometimes I'll see work that's addressing, uh, for example, displacement related to disasters, um, and it's and it's well researched, but it's missing the point in terms of how the discussions are actually being framed or debated. And so you risk, um, if you don't understand the policy environment within within which you're working, you risk your work being discounted because it's seen as not understanding how it's being discussed or debated. And that's where I was talking about that idea of of that mediating role uh, in terms of helping bridge the gap, or that gap in terms of understanding issues so that they can actually then feed into policy discussions so that they're seen as relevant. Um, does that make sense? Absolutely. And, yeah. and I think it's about a really nice link with um, sort of picking up Phil's point um, on Hopper, that he's sort of extended to think about power. I mean, we think about policy making, you know, institutions, um, we think about sort of power broking and where that power sits. Um, do you think that sort of art practice is a way of, of leveling in terms of, of that power or a way of engaging differently um, in terms of what art can bring to that particular form of discourse? I, I mean, for me, you need you need pressure that comes from from all different places. So so you only advance like international law, for example, only develops when you have pressure coming from civil society, when you have governments working and you have you have all of these different um, conversations happening and different power being pushed from different areas. And so I think that's also where we think about your own practice. What's your role in terms of how do you see yourself as an artist and where do you want to be? Do you want to be sitting and working inside the system or do you see that you'd feel like you'd have more freedom, artistic freedom and be able to advance the issues that you want from outside? Um, and I think all of those things you need to, to take into account, but all of them are valuable because there's also some things that civil society can push and address that isn't possible for governments to say necessarily, at least initially. So I think that's where, again, where I think about if you want to engage, think about where you want to sit and where you think your strengths are and where in that process you would you would best fit. I think Phil's point about it, that he makes in the chat actually about um, being aware of power dynamics and power relations is absolutely essential i mean i think that's good principle for for as he said engaging with any institution especially with government um i think it's interesting that art in some respects provides a voice for people which you may not have a voice otherwise and so i think that's a kind of quite an interesting fundamental point uh, i mean i know there's huge issues in the art world about diversity and about you know whose voice is necessarily heard that well which, which i completely take um, but but um, I, I think art does give a lot of uh, interesting voices to people uh, who 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 in a um, uh, sorry this is uh, Francois Masarassi uh, made these points in in some of his writing um, but people who may not necessarily have had the opportunity to make a point uh, in, in a political sense for whatever reason fear of repression 
but there's a, art provides quite an interesting, ambiguous and subtle and nuanced way of making some of those points. Yeah. I think that's a fantastic point for us to close on. Unfortunately, we're coming up to the, the end of our time for our session today. But first of all, I would just like to use this opportunity to thank you both so much, Stephen and Hannah, for sharing um, and giving us all food for thought on um, what art can be and what art can give within this particular space. So thank you so much. I know that we've got links to both of your work um, in, the, um, in the chat, so if people want to out and to follow up on anything that's been sort of said today there's certainly the opportunity to do that and there'll be a recording that will be available via UAL so we know that a lot more people sort of watch after and join the session so thank you so much everybody for joining us on this afternoon just to say as well a big thank you to the social design institute to lucy kimball uh, director of the sdi but also to louise who's done a fantastic job in terms of organizing us all and putting this on today so thank you so much if people want to join the social design institute mailing list um it's social design institute at arts.ac.uk for all of our events and all of our research as well. We've got a few research sessions that are coming up, including myself, who will be speaking later this week, and another session that will be at the same time next week in terms of a research showcase. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for thinking and engaging, and I look forward to seeing you all soon again. Thank you. <laughs>